I'm Gina Hennen. I'm the winemaker at Adelsheim Vineyard. Uh, we're in the northern Willamette Valley, just outside of Newburgh, Oregon, and we're found within the Willamette Valley AVA, or American Viticultural Area. And within the Willamette Valley AVA, there are multiple smaller uh, nested AVAs, and we are in the Chehala Mountains, which is actually that ridge right behind me. So the, the Adelsheim Vineyard was the first winery founded in the Chehala Mountains AVA, founded by David and Ginny Adelsheim, um, who founded the winery in their garage, as a matter of fact. That was back in 1971 when David Adelsheim and Ginny Adelsheim bought a really beautiful piece of property called Quarter Mile Lane, which is just a couple minutes drive up in those hills. But in the mid 90s, we built the winery here uh, at the Calkins Lane property. So the winery is just over here, you can't quite see it, but we'll take you in there in a little bit and show you around so that you can see an idea of how the winery is laid out and what kinds of things happen. Um, but for here in the vineyard, I wanted to talk a little bit about all the decision making that has gone into our wines by this point. So we have a lot of vineyard properties. We currently have six estate properties and they're all very different from each other. I am standing here um, on the cusp of harvest and you can see the grapes behind me. These are all Pinot Noir grapes. Um, so the decision point from now onward is when to pick. That's the next decision point. Um, but then there's a whole host of things that have happened before this. You know, throughout the growing season, these things start to bud out in April. Before that, we did pruning on them. And all of those things take an awful lot of time and care and experience. Um, so the vineyard crew will go through and tend these vines and to make them look exactly the way that they do right now so that we can go through and pick the crop at a perfectly appropriate level, have the exact right amount of sun exposure. All of those things go into the kinds of wines that we want to make. So now we're inside the winery. This is inside Adelson Vineyard. And we will assume that at this point, the grapes have been picked. Um, so by this point, we will have done a lot of tasting to figure out what the ripening curve looks like for those blocks that we were just looking at. What kind of, um, chemistry, juice chemistries they have, and to figure out the exact right moment to pick. So once the grapes are picked, they'll come into the winery and they'll go through our processing line. And so that looks like a big shaker table that the grapes are fed into. They get spread out because of the vibrational table onto a sorting table. And we'll have people on either side of the table pulling off any material that we don't want, which include things like leaves, um, stems, and any clusters that aren't perfect. Um, once those are once those are all sorted out, they go into the distemmer. So the distemmer um, has a rotating paddle that'll knock the berries gently off the rachis or the stem. The berries will fall down through a chute and get filled into a tank, um, and the stems will get out the other side and then we'll compost those. So now the berries are all in a tank. So we have different size tanks like you have here behind me. We also have much smaller tanks that we'll use as well. Um, all of which for Pinot Noir are stainless steel tanks. As well, what happens when the yeast are in the juice, they're eating up all the sugar and they're producing carbon dioxide and alcohol. And the carbon dioxide creates little bubbles of gas that will push up all of the, the, the cap material. So it's all the skins and the seeds will all bubble up to the top and that can get fairly dry and also very hot. It's like an insulating blanket. So what we wanna do is to do some kind of cap management. So that could include a punch down where you physically push the cap down um, or you could do a pump over which takes some liquid out of the bottom and then you can spray it over the top of the cap. That helps cool the fermentation as well as helps to mix it up. So if you're going for a big, rich, very bold style, you might do more cap management. If you're going for a more um, refined, elegant style, you might back off a little bit. So once fermentation is finished, then it's time for pressing. And so that means that we have to let all the wine come out of the tank that will flow on its own. That's called the free run. But there's also an awful lot of liquid still in there. It's like a juicy must. So to press the must in order to extract more of the wine. And then to do that, we put them into a press like this. 
So we will dig, physically dig out all of the skins and seeds that are still in the tank and load them into the press. This is actually David's first white wine press um, from a long time ago. Um, and we love it for Pinot Noir, it's very gentle. So when it, what happens in the press is you put all the, the, the solids in and there's a big central bag that slowly inflates and squeezes against this screen. And so you have, it's like a sieve basically. So the liquid will come out of the sieve and drip down into the juice tray. Um, and then that, that portion can get pumped out into a settling tank before it goes down to barrel. Um, so for pressing, it's a pretty critical piece of the puzzle. How you press, how much time it takes for you to press, all has a big impact on the kind of tannins and the, the, the amount of the texture that you get from the wine. Um, so we like a little bit of the press wine in with the free run portion because it gives some structure. Once the wine is done with the pressing stage, it'll go into a settling tank where it'll sit for usually four to six days and the very heavy solids will fall to the bottom and then we will wrap. So that means to pull the clear liquid off the top of the settlings and put that down into a barrel. So up to this point, we've been talking exclusively about red wine production and how those wines are made. We also make an awful lot of white wine here at Adelsheim, including Chardonnay and, and Pinot Blanc. And that happens in a slightly different way than the Pinot Noir. So in the case of white grapes, we will load grapes whole cluster, whole bunch, directly into the press. Um, there's another inflatable bag, just like we saw with the red press, that will slowly inflate there's a lot of different ways to finesse your press cycle to get exactly the kind of juice that you want um, to make wine out of. So once your press cycle is done with its inflation, so there's juice coming out of the sieve, just like you saw with the Pinot. The juice goes into the tray down here, and then we'll pump that into one of our stainless steel tanks. Um, there, we will look at the turbidity meaning how many solids, what is the clarity of the juice. We like a bit of turbidity because it creates some interesting textural qualities um, in your fermentation and in the eventual wine, but not so much that the fermentations can struggle. So dialing that in, the turbidity level, is a really key part of the Chardonnay process. Once it's in tank and at the right turbidity level, we'll start the fermentation. Um, so we'll either add yeast or let it start to go on its own um, for a native inoculation. So during fermentation of Chardonnay, um, we will want to put it down into barrel. So those will go into um, French oak barrels, and then it will stay there for usually about 12 months, occasionally up till 14 months. Again, it's dependent on the vintage and the kinds of qualities that we want to get from our Chardonnay in that year. That's the general overview of the Chardonnay process, and now we'll move into the barrel room. Now that the wine has been pressed, we'll put it down into barrel. So all of our Pinot Noir goes into French oak barrels and almost all of our Chardonnay goes into French oak barrels as well. It's about 25 cases of wine per barrel. We also have things called punchins, which are twice the size of these. And we like those for Chardonnay because they give a bit more texture to the wine without giving a toasty kind of quality that you get from the wood. So once the wine is in barrel, It'll stay here for about 10 months for our Pinot Noir, um, as long as 12 or 13 months for the Chardonnays, just depending on the, the blend and the vintage that it's going to be part of. Um, and then we'll get them ready for bottle. So that'll mean taking all the wine out of all of these hundreds and hundreds of barrels and putting them into a larger tank where we can blend the wine together. And that process is very tasting and intensive. It involves us tasting all of these barrels multiple times and then figuring out how they might fit best together. It's really different every year because we don't have a recipe that determines how these blends will fit together. It's really tasting driven, um, which means it takes a lot of time <laughs> in order to get through all of these barrels and figure out where their destination is. As you might be picking up, a lot of winemaking is based on um, experience and the experience that you have with those vineyards across a lot of different types of vintages. Um, and it takes a long time to arrive at the decisions that you get to, not only in the harvest season, but all the other ones prior to that. You know, and a winemaker might have 
20 or 30 or maybe 40 different vintages in their lifetime to make all these decisions. Um, and you kind of get one crack at it every year. There's a lot of people and a lot of time, labor, and hours that go into making these products. Um, but it's something that we all really are passionate about because they're delicious. <laughs> and it's really wonderful for us to be able to share the, the distinctive terroirs that we work with, um, with the public. So thank you for joining us on the tour today. Appreciate it. And hopefully you'll have a chance to taste these wines yourself soon.